the Barron Investment Conference in New York City with Ron Barron. And uh, we've been meeting with many of the companies that uh, Ron's been a big investor in. Uh, right now, it's time for our exclusive interview with Robin Denholm. She is Tesla's chairman. Ron Barron, of course, is here, too. And uh, Barron's been an investor in Tesla and a big backer of this company for four or five years. Uh, five. Five years at this point. Rob, we want to thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, this is the first time that CNBC is sitting down with you, and we're almost at a year from the time when you were tapped to come in and, and be the chairman at Tesla. That's right. Yeah, it, obviously, that was a very interesting time. Elon is the biggest shareholder in the company. He agreed to have separation of the CEO and chairman roles because there was so much pressure coming from the SEC and, and, and from, I guess, from investors as well. At the time, people said that you were going to be the adult in the room. Um, obviously, that's a little insulting to Elon to think of it like that, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Elon, how the two of you work together, and what's happened over the course of the last year? Well, Becky, um, I've been on the board for five years before, uh, as at this point in time, and so uh, we formed a good working relationship. And, and actually, I think it's um, it's a joy to be in that environment, both from a Tesla perspective, but also with working with, with Elon as well. So you knew him for a long time beforehand. How did your relationship change or just the way you work together change as you took on the role of chairman? How often do you see him? How much do yeah, you Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously we have our regular board meetings, but uh, but we also have conversations in between. And so they're, uh, they, they're relatively regular. Uh, but, you know, sometimes there are more than others and, you know, it's a it's a good working relationship. You are uh, somebody who's got an incredibly impressive background, both in technology and in auto companies as well. You worked at Toyota uh, most recently before you took this job. Uh, you were the chief operating officer at Telstra. So you've got a, a very good working knowledge base, somebody who has looked over so many different issues and, and had so much experience. What types of conversations do you have with Elon? What, what types of things do you talk about now? Yeah, I mean, my background in terms of uh, both operational and financial uh, roles, and I've zigzagged between the two, uh, irrespective of uh, which company. Uh, and I've always been very focused on making sure that we're driving long-term shareholder value for, for uh, the company. And so, uh, as a board member, I take that responsibility very seriously, and as do the rest of my peers. And, um, you know, in terms of conversation, they can be very varied. They could be, um, you know, things that are going on in the company, uh, you know, whether it's uh, from an employee perspective or uh, future plans in terms of uh, different things, different operational issues or financial issues. Um, the team's very focused and very accomplished at doing many things. And uh, as you can see from the results yesterday, they're, uh, they're doing very well. So, so Elon is totally focused, laser focused, on cost of operations. And what he does, in my, you know, my observation, he listens. So when you say something to him, and it makes sense, he listens. In fact, he has his teams of young people throughout the organization telling him constantly, Elon, and, and uh, uh, Jerome, for example, will have regular meetings with his staff and say, what can we do better? And then he says, if they come up with an idea, they show it to Elon, and then he does it. Yeah. And so presumably, he listens to you as well for, and this is for Larry Ellison as well for ideas that you can Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the board's got a, a great background in many different industries, to Ron's point. And I think, um, uh, you know, I think the, the testament is any uh, uh, CEO who actually can continue to grow a company the way uh, Elon has with Tesla is going to listen to all, all points of view that are going to help the company move forward. And I think that's very true in this case. I do think the team is fantastic. It's the best executive team uh, that I've seen in the many years that I've been there. And um, whilst they may be young in age, they're absolutely experienced both in terms of the way Tesla works, but in terms of the areas that they're uh, focused on. And I think I think that, um, as, as I said, the results yesterday uh, showed that it's a point in time, and obviously we're here for the long term. But I think that um, you know, just incrementally continuing to do better and um, setting ambitious targets and actually achieving those is, is huge. I'll, I'll ask both of you this question: Are you glad that he's not tweeting as much? <laughs> I think, um, you know, he is a very disciplined individual and, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, the way he runs that, that company is, is phenomenal, so in all aspects. 
you know, when you talk about listening, then one of the directors had told me a year ago that he had come up with a chart. And the chart was when Elon tweeted what the stock had done, and when he hadn't tweeted what the stock had done. It outperformed when he wasn't tweeting? Yes. And so basically, <laughs> tell him you know, that? about, yeah, this, object, this director did. And so talking about listening, so he listens to Rob, and he listens to this other director, he listens to everyone. And that's how come they're able to be as, as uh, agile as they are. They have 42,000 employees, 42,000. This is not reliance upon one man, but he has empowered people to be able to make decisions and to be able to do what's best for the company. And when people can figure out how they can perform and produce quality at a lower cost, he says, do it, right? He says, you don't have to go through chain of command, they were telling me about how they were trying to make batteries for other people. And they said, they said it was terrible. Daimler and uh, Toyota, I guess it was, they, were, they, they had a, a, a Tesla was doing things for them. And they would say, okay, so we need a battery that can have zero fault tolerance. I said, well, if zero, if it can have 5% or 2%, we could do it at half cost. And telling Toyota, and they said, no, no, this is what we have to do. We have, so it was, it was stratified. Whereas our company, Tesla, what they do is they're able to act quickly. Right. And that's a big, big deal when you're trying to grow the way you are in a highly regulated business to produce a high quality product that can kill people. Uh, by the, Andrew's got a question here too. And, and Robin, if you just look at this camera when he answers it. Andrew, go ahead. Hey Robin, uh, and thank you for that, Becky. Uh, you know, uh, you chair the company obviously, but you also chair the audit committee. And I just wanted you to speak, if you could, to some of the critics around the accounting at the company. And one of the questions that came up, particularly this quarter, was this idea of, of that the company had a, a big profit swing, as you know, uh, $550 million sequentially, but it did so on declining revenue. How does that happen? And is that a repeatable event? Well, as uh, we've talked about, the company is very focused on growth and uh, very focused on cost reduction at the same time. And it's very uh, unusual to find a company that's focused on both at the same time. And Tesla is focused on that. And so uh, in terms of the chairing of the audit committee, I have been the chair of the audit committee since I joined the board in, in 14. And I'm very uh, happy with the way the company handles all of its fiduciary responsibilities and its accounting. So, so I, I would also add that uh, the price that Tesla received for their average car in the last quarter was $13,000 less than it had been the quarter before, and they made $2,000 less in profits than they did. So therefore, they're really focused on costs uh, that they're able to achieve. Uh, and, and in fact, right now, prices on their cars are actually going up. So every time someone else can, uh, offers a new competitive car, Tesla sales increased when Tyan, uh, was it Tyan? Is that the name of the other? Uh, so when they, Tycan. Tycan. So when Tycan was introduced to Porsche, I'm sure it's going to be a lovely car, but when it's been introduced, Tesla's orders increase fairly significantly and the prices in Tesla cars are going up and they're getting people worried about the X and S. They had some old inventory, which they, uh, in the second quarter, uh, penalized profitability, lower cost. But now what's happening is that they're actually charging higher prices for the S and the X than they had been before. So prices is going up on products, demand is going up across the board, and they're just, and whenever they're uh, showing product in European markets, sales are going through the roof. Yeah. And so, um, as one said, in terms of uh, the demand that's happening, uh, it's, it's strong across uh, multiple geographies at a time. So, uh, and we talked, uh, the team talked about uh, the revenue decline uh, as a result of also the leasing proportion. So if you go back a year ago, the leasing proportion that we had, or cars that were being leased, particularly the Model 3, was a very, very low percentage. And we've been increasing that over time as well. So I wanted to follow up with you on is uh, given that you spent a lot of time of your life in, in Asia, I wanted to just ask about China. The factory in China that Tesla uh, is, is putting together, who owns that factory and what's the relationship with the Chinese government? 
So Tesla owns the factory, um, and the reason why uh, the company's built that factory is uh, we see a huge opportunity for growth in uh, in China. Uh, it is the largest market today for mid-sized premium uh, vehicles, both in terms of uh, sedans and SUVs. And as we bring that factory online, and you heard on the earnings call that actually we're in trial production today, only 10 months after we broke ground uh, in that site, which is a phenomenal achievement. Um, we plan to uh, produce vehicles in, in China for the Chinese market and take advantage of that opportunity that we see in the growth there. Robin, just in terms of the ramp up there, we, we did have an analyst on yesterday who said, yeah, it looks pretty promising what you're doing in China, but that in the past, some of what Tesla's done has been to ramp up and bring a lot of employees in, get things up, and then maybe scale back as you see what demand actually shapes up to be. He pointed out that that's not the way it works in China, that if you are working with Chinese companies, with Chinese employees, you don't have that flexibility. What, what do you say to that, and what does that lead you to believe just in terms of profitability or how you're able to be flexible in that market? Yeah, I think uh, what I would say is all of the learnings that we've had in terms of ramping uh, the company, both with Model 3 and, the, and S and X, uh, have been applied to China. And so the team on the ground, whether it's on the tooling side, whether it's on the uh, workforce side, or even just how we interact with our suppliers have all been uh, um, put into place as we're uh, building the China uh, factory. And so the team's done a phenomenal job. Uh, Ron mentioned Jerome before. He and, and the local team in China have been working hand in glove to make sure that we take uh, advantage of all of the things that we've learned over the last few years. And you were also talking about scaling back this first plant. Well, just making sure you have enough employees to get off the ground and then maybe changing the size of the employment group. But, but once their you first it out. operation, which is just opening, yeah. is to, uh, to build, to build 3,000 cars a week. That's 150,000 cars a year. On this conference call yesterday, or the day before, day before. So yeah, e Elon said they were going to triple that amount. So basically, instead of doing 3,000 cars a week, they're on their way to 10,000 cars a week or more in China. Let me just ask you about a couple of those things, Robin, because um, I said earlier that sometimes Elon overpromises and underdelivers. Ron corrected me and said, no, he overpromises and then delivers just a little later than you thought you were going to get it. <laughs> Let me ask you about a couple of those numbers. Uh, the delivery goal between 360,000 and 400,000 vehicles, uh, is that that's the full year vehicle forecast. Do you think that that's an achievable goal? Yeah, so, so the way I think about it is um, to achieve what Tesla has achieved over the, over the last five years, over the last 10 years, you have to set audacious goals and big goals to actually, and then have everybody in the company work like crazy to get there. And again, if I, if I look back over the last five years, nobody had predicted that Tesla would be where they are today in terms of producing 97,000 vehicles a quarter and or building a factory in China in 10 months. So the team is awesome, and I think part of it is setting those very big goals so that the, the company can rally and get behind them and move forward and move the whole industry forward. Robin, I want to thank you so much for your time and being thank so generous you. with us. Ron, I want to thank you for your time and joining us here. Thanks for inviting us. Um, it's been amazing having you here. We really appreciate it.